without further ado, um, I give you our first speaker. As I say, we're going to have two speakers today. Um, we, this is our opportunity to, to showcase some of our up and coming researchers, our postdocs in the department, uh, and give them a, a platform to show what they can really do. Because quite frankly, um, hearing from the PI is great, but you know full well none of them are set foot in the lab in the last 10 years anyway. Um, so we want to hear from the people that have actually done the work. Um, first off is uh, Dr. Uh, Nidal Khatib. Um, I do apologize if I screw that up. It's uh, okay. entirely my fault. Uh, he's in Neve Nolan's lab uh, and he studies musculoskeletal biomechanics, as uh, as many other people in the lab do. He joins us from a variety of different places, doing his BA in, uh, in Reading and Biomedical Sciences, did an MA in UCL, hopped across to Wales to Cardiff to do his PhD, and we finally managed to drag him back to London uh, to study uh, uh, mechanobiology. Uh, in Neve's lab. Uh, his talk is going to be on the mechanobiology and biomechanics of skeletal development. Um, so I'm going to shut up, um, let him share his screen. And as I say, if there's any questions, stick them in the chat and we'll ask them at the end. Cheers. Cheers, Chris. Um, and let's just get this. Okay, is that coming up all right? Yep, all good. Yep, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. And um, yeah, I'm really glad to uh, be giving a talk today about the mechanobiology of skeletal development. Um, as a bioengineer, uh, something that's always fascinated me about skeletal tissues is the very important role physical stimuli has in uh, guiding healthy skeletal development, as well as maintaining healthy cartilage and bone through a lifetime of uh, physical insult, you know, through walking, running, exercise, etc. And um, well, during uh, gestation, uh, physical stimuli generated from muscles uh, that we see in the form of uh, fetal kicking, stretching, and whole body movements, um, they're, they're vital for normal formation of long bones and joints. Um, and so taking a research interest in this is, is quite important because disruption of this delicate interaction between mechanics and biology due to reduced movements uh, can lead to severe skeletal conditions um, that are very present in our population today, like um, osteoarthritis, which you might all be uh, quite familiar with, um, which leads to uh, horrible debilitating uh, full, full knee replacements, um, arthrogryposis, which leads to a skeletal malformations and developmental di developmental dysplasia of the hip, uh, which leads to a frequent uh, dislocation of the femur from the hip. Um, and uh, so not only has this been found in clinical cases, but also through uh, experimentation of fetal immobilization models, where previous studies, including that from our group, have shown um, abnormal formation of spine, limbs, and joints following um, immobilization in early development. Um, so by further understanding the link between abnormal uh, mechanics and disease, uh, we might be able to develop treatment strategies to overcome some of these um, conditions. And as well, in, as well as finding solutions for skeletal conditions arriving prenatally, uh, studying the mechanobiology of skeletal development may help us to improve skeletal conditions that arrive postnatally, such as uh, post-traumatic osteoarthritis um, that can occur from injury earlier on in life. Um, and the issue is tissue-engineered cartilage and bone, that is uh, tissues that are grown in the lab, um, have been used for years clinically for repairing uh, damaged tissues. But the current solutions are quite far from perfect. Um, engineered cartilage lacks the highly organized matrix and mechanical properties of native cartilage and loses function over time and leads to eventual complications further down the line. So we'd like to improve this. And um, well, developmental engineering is a relatively new area. Um, and, and what it does is it aims to learn um, and improve tissue engineering of bone and cartilage by uh, recapitulating processes that occur during endochondral ossification, uh, which is the pr uh, precise uh, series of steps by which all long bones are formed during fetal development as a means to produce more highly organized and more functional tissues in vitro. And since uh, mechanical stimulation is essential for skeletal tissue development, it makes sense to understand what kind of stimulation is optimal, as well as the, um, the mechanisms that occur behind sensing and translating these signals to uh, skeletal growth and maturation to hopefully improve the efficacy of, of some of these techniques. And uh, quite an exciting uh, bit of uh, recent research um, uh, from a group over at Trinity College Dublin. Um, so they're showing that not only can um, apply mechanical stimulation such as hydrostatic pressure 
um, uh, improve the, for the formation of cartilage matrix in vitro, but also uh, the uh, formation of organized bone mineral uh, when applied in tandem with um, endochondral priming techniques. So it appears then that regulating the mechanical environment might be critical for these techniques to work. So with that in mind, uh, my work here over at Imperial in the, over the last year has spilled into two uh, separate aims. Uh, firstly, to better understand the influence of the type in, in the form of uh, frequency, as well as the quantity of mechanical stimulation uh, on cartilage and bone development uh, during a critical stage of joint development. Um, and then secondly, uh, identify how mechanical stimulation influences cleatogenesis by investigating mechanisms by which biophysical stimulus can induce a change in uh, cartilage and bone formation in the process we call uh, mechanical transduction. And the second aim in particular would help identify new therapeutic targets uh, that mimic the beneficial effects of uh, biophysical stimuli to potentially treat skeletal conditions such as osteoarthritis with um, ana you know, anabolic therapies and that kind of thing. And uh, so one way in which our research group aims to tackle these kind of goals is by employing a mechanostimulation bioreactor. And it, this allows us to culture uh, whole fetal limbs uh, in vitro. Usually animal models such as the uh, chicken mouse are used um, and then mechanically stimulate them. And so firstly, we harvest and pin down the limbs to uh, a de deformable polyurethane uh, step in, in, a, in a flex position. And um, we then place the foams into uh, these uh, culture chambers that are filled with culture media. And then um, we apply compressive force by uh, the programmable, programmable um, loading platens to simulate physiological flexion um, with sim similar ranges to that seen in OVO, that is uh, during gestation. Um, so in order to explore the effects of frequency and duration um, of mechanical stimulation on sclerosogenesis, uh, chick embryos uh, were first harvested at um, uh, nine days uh, of incubation and their hind limbs were removed. And then either either cultured completely uh, statically in a static chamber uh, with no loading whatsoever or um, uh, within one to six um, uh, dynamic loading chambers programmed with a, a sinusoidal uh, loading profile. And uh, within uh, the six dynamic chambers, half the limbs are exposed to a lower frequency of 0.33 hertz or a higher frequency of 0.67 hertz. And within those two groups, uh, they're exposed to either uh, they're exposed to two-hour loading steps, either once, twice, or three times a day. And um, with the loading steps that occurred multiple times a day, um, they, they were spread out evenly across 24 hours. And uh, finally, the, the total culture time. Uh, was uh, around seven days. So we managed to culture around six limbs uh, per group here, um, ex except for in the static group, which we uh, managed to culture around 12. And the, the hypothesis here was that um, higher frequency and extended duration of mechanical stimulation would promote cartilage growth, matrix production, um, as well as bone mineralization. And so um, what we do here to, in order to quantify cartilage shape is that we first stain them with um, Alchem blue to visualize the uh, proteoglycans components of cartilage, um, as well as alizarin red to uh, visualize the calcium uh, component of uh, bone mineral. And then we use optical projection tomography along with segmentation tools to generate 3D models of the rudiments that can then be um, uh, quantitatively or, or qualitatively um, assessed uh, to look at cartilage growth and shape. And from the 3D cartilage models, uh, we managed to measure uh, eight different features of the knee or the, or the stifle joint in chick. Uh, and it, this was taken from either the uh, distal femur or pro proximal tibiotarsis. And we also managed to collect two uh, measurements of absolute mineral length of the, uh, of the femur and tibia. Uh, so first off, um, a two-way ANOVA was run on the six groups of frequency and duration to determine if there was an interaction between uh, the effect of frequency and duration of loading on uh, cartilage feature growth and mineralization, as well as any uh, independent effects of frequency um, or duration of loading on growth. And uh, so first off, uh, an interaction effect was found for a single measurement, but since um, medial condyle width wasn't uh, generally um, si significantly influenced by mechanical loading at all, this interaction was uh, not, not really further examined. 
so on the other hand, when looking at the uh, independent effects of duration and frequency of loading, um, it was interesting to find that the growth of uh, four out of eight of the um, features were uh, at, uh, cartilage fe joint features and mineralization measurements were significantly affected by uh, loading duration. But on the other hand, only mineralization alone was affected by uh, loading frequency. And so to explore the independent effects of uh, duration and frequency further, um, the significantly affected uh, cartilage feature measurements were pooled according to the uh, duration of loading, which you can see on the top row, or the frequency of loading on the bottom row. Uh, and they were plotted uh, alongside measurements from non-loaded static samples. And, what, and we expectedly, um, there was a trend of increasing cartilage feature growth with uh, increasing loading duration in a, in a dose-dependent manner. And feature growth of limbs loaded three times a day um, compared to just once per day, um, as well as the, the static controls um, were uh, was particularly evident. But on the other hand, when you look at the same measurements uh, pooled according to the frequency of loading, there didn't seem to, be, seem to be any statistical observed differences between those loaded at low and high frequency, um, except for uh, statistical differences between those loaded and uh, versus the, the static samples. On the other hand, when examining the effect of loading on mineralization, the limbs exposed to dynamic loading for at least twice a day um, exhibited a significantly longer mineral length compared to uh, non-loaded limbs. And also, um, in contrast to cartilage growth, it was evident that um, independently increasing both duration and frequency uh, catalyzed the extent of mineral formation. And this suggests that cartilage and bone may respond differently to the same biophysical stimulus. And in order to have a, a closer look at the effect of loading on joint shape, outlines were taken of the features from the 3D models, um, that is the medial lateral condyles as well as the tibiotarsus. Um, and it was interesting to find that in addition to the clear differences in size of the joint shapes as, as detected in the quantitative analysis, limbs loaded uh, three times a day displayed more prominent um, posterior um, curls, particularly for the medial condyles, um, as well as uh, for the anterior and posterior protrusions. And both, both uh, the changes of these uh, features are thought to be an adaptation of the joint surface to regions of increased loading, which is an important process of uh, joint shaping. So when qualitatively comparing the differences in uh, glycosamine and glycans production, um, and glycosamine and glycans here are stained with uh, toluidine blue, um, so when comparing that across um, all the groups, there appeared to be a, a striking increase in proteoglycans deposition throughout the, the lateral condyle uh, and the uh, metaphysis of samples loaded three times a day uh, relative to those just loaded once a day and relative to static controls. Uh, and so this is mainly indicated by the increase in toluidine uh, blue stain retention. Um, it's, it appeared to be much clearer in, in regions of the uh, higher, higher cell density, sort of closer to the um, articulating uh, surfaces of the, of the joint. But the second main observation here is that there are no real clear differences between samples loaded at a lower frequency um, versus the, uh, the higher frequency. Um, so sort of supporting previous findings we found with the quantification of uh, feature growth. Um, so next, uh, we looked at uh, collagen deposition, uh, which is another uh, imp important um, component of uh, cartilage matrix. And there, there weren't any clear differences between um, limbs, from, limbs from group that were, uh, uh, no, no clear difference between limbs that were sort of uh, loaded uh, versus the, the static samples, um, which sort of lacked the increased collagen content around the, an um, the anterior and articulating uh, surfaces of the joint. Um, in addition, it appeared that samples loaded at high frequency uh, three times a day exhibited increased production of collagen around the uh, metaphysis and diaphysis compared to other samples, uh, where the tissue might be experiences increased, uh, experiencing uh, increased stress uh, during loading. So in conclusion for this first part, we uh, found that cartilage growth, shaping, as well as glycosamine and glycans deposition, which is a very important um, matrix component of cartilage, uh, is sensitive to loading duration but not frequency, um, at least within the ranges examined, uh, which partly corroborated our hypothesis. And the extent of mineralization is influenced by both duration and frequency of stimulation. So together the outcome suggests the formation of cartilage and bone differs uh, in response to biophysical stimulus. And therefore uh, these results have implications for developmental engineering strategies aiming to 
mediate the formation of um, intermediary tissues and selectively uh, engineer bone and cartilage. So these previous uh, results, as well as those from other studies, then imply that mechanical forces play a fundamental role in, in cartilage and bone growth. Um, however, the underlying mechanisms behind how mechanical stimuli are sensed or transduced in developing tissues is an equally important question and still very unclear, particularly in developing tissues. And to give a little background on this, well, um, in order for skeletal tissues to sense and respond to mechanical forces, primary mesenchymal uh, cell membranes are loaded with a whole range of mechanoreceptors, such as ion channels um, and, and integrins, to, to name a couple. And these are particularly abundant around uh, mechanoreceptor sites, such as the, the primary cilium, which is involved in uh, detecting uh, fluid flow, for example. Um, and external um, mechanical forces, such as hydrostatic pressure, ECM, uh, extracellular matrix defama deformation, and fluid flow, activate these receptors, causing bio biochemical changes, such as the permeation of ions, um, such as calcium, into, this, into the cell. Uh, activating intracellular signaling pathways uh, that are involved in the anabolic response, growth, and uh, maturation of tissue. And so previous work within our group actually determined that blocking uh, mechanosensitive ion channels eliminated the effects of applied mechanical loading on chick joint morphogenesis, which was super interesting. And this is particularly um, important since there are a whole range of channelopathies that is, um, inherited mutations of these ion channels that lead to a bunch of severe uh, musculoskeletal um, deficits during development. So with that in mind, um, one such channelopathy is that of uh, transient receptor potential V4 or, or TRIP-V4, a commonly investigated target uh, for understanding mechanotransduction in uh, mesenchymal stem cells. And since ion channels like to be involved in skeletal development, it seems like a good target to investigate further for its role in burning cartilage formation. Uh, it also has well-defined um, antagonists and agonists, which make, make it uh, easy to look at in vitro. And our hypothesis here was that TRIP-V4 promotes cartilage growth and, and mineralization in, in uh, early limb development. So first off, to, to, com uh, to confirm the presence of TRIP-V4 in developing tissues, uh, we first fluorescently tagged it in a section of uh, mouse embryo hind limb tissue. And in these confocal images, you can see that the, uh, the cell nuclei um, highlighted in red uh, cytoskeleton highlighted in blue and, and the ion channel um, highlighted in green here um, seems to be um, uh, isolated on the uh, cell cell membrane so that's yeah that's that, that's promising um, so we have the trip before localization in our developing tissues and so this time around we we opted to use mouse embryo hind limbs uh, which, which we harvested at thylus stage 24 uh, oh, sorry about the uh, the end numbers there. <laughs> and uh, they were split into um, uh, paired groups this time round. Uh, so the first group was um, uh, uh, just dynamically loaded versus statically cultured lim limbs, and that was to validate the effect of loading on cartilage in and mineralization in mouse hind limbs. Uh, the second group was uh, dynamically loaded control limbs, uh, which are just exposed to um, a drug vehicle alone uh, versus loaded limbs exposed to uh, a TRIP-V4 um, channel inhibitor, RN1354. Uh, and, uh, and the final group was the static culture limbs exposed to a drug vehicle versus uh, treated with the TRIP-V4 inhibitor to make sure that there were no toxic effects of the drug in culture. And this time around, a fixed loading regime of uh, 0.67 Hertz was applied um, with two hour loading periods um, applied three times a day uh, which was the most optimal uh, regime from the previous uh, study. And just the same as before, uh, cartilage uh, growth and, and mineral quantification was done by measuring these uh, uh, joint features uh, using our 3D um, uh, model uh, analysis. And this time around, uh, to explore the differences of cartilage feature growth um, across the paired groups, the paired differences were plotted as an average change for each feature in colored uh, according to whether the change was significant, red being significant and blue, uh, green being uh, non-significant. And firstly, it was evident that six out of eight features across the medial and lateral condyles, as well as the tibia, were significantly increased in size in response to the uh, dynamic loading compared to static culture alone, which validated the effects of loading on growth um, in mouse embryo hind limbs, so that was positive. And interestingly then, um, blocking the trip before ion channel in dynamically loaded limbs appeared to inhibit the effect of uh, loading on growth in six features also, 
although the lateral condyle uh, this time around appeared to be uh, the most affected. And what's interesting here was that the, the average difference um, between uh, samples that were uh, statically and dynamically loaded, um, as well as um, dynamically loaded versus uh, dynamically loaded and blocked, appeared to be relatively similar. Um, finally, then, um, exposing um, static culture limbs to the trip before blocker appeared to have no effect on uh, future growth at all. And so altogether, uh, these findings suggest that trip before may be critical in the transaction of mechanical signals that guide um, uh, cartilage growth. So uh, next to explore the differences in the extent of mineralization across the pair groups, uh, the pair differences were plotted for each of the, sam uh, each of the samples um, as opposed to uh, the averages due to the smaller number of uh, features. Um, and this time around, uh, it, uh, um, it revealed that there were no clear uh, effects of dynamic loading on either femoral or tibial mineral length compared to limbs cultured in uh, uh, static chambers. Um, and secondly, there didn't appear to be any clear effect of blocking trip before and mineral length in both dynamic cultured or static limbs either. Uh, and the average uh, differences uh, uh, within these groups were very minimal. Uh, so then we moved on then to uh, looking at um, a qualitative assessment of, um, uh, again, glycosamine and glycans and collagen, both components of a cartilage matrix. And this time round, uh, we used a combination stain of, of toluidine blue and picrocerus red. Uh, so to, to look at them in one slide. Um, and then that was then to determine the effect of inhibiting uh, trip before on matrix production. So the top row presents uh, joint subjective dynamic loading with the drug vehicle alone, and the bottom row, uh, the drug vehicle uh, with the trip before inhibitor. And it was super interesting here to find that in, in the femoral lateral condyle, medial condyle, and the, and the proximal tibia, particularly alongside the articulating um, uh, surfaces of the joints, there was uh, little to no uh, glycosamine or glycans produced. So that suggested that TRIP-V4 might also have a role in promoting the expression of matrix genes in, in developing tissues, as is found in previous work from other groups using uh, culture, cultured um, um, zygomal stem cells. So to probe these findings a little more, um, we looked at the localization of TRIP-V4 using immunofluorescence again, uh, and that was carried out within uh, sections of the same samples. And so immediately it was noticeable that while trip before expression in the uh, control samples appeared to be consistent throughout the joint tissues, it was drastically reduced in samples exposed to the trip before um, in inhibitor, particularly in, in the central uh, zones, um, suggesting the expression of trip before is um, at least um, in part self-regulating. And uh, the second interesting finding was that the regions ex um, expressing significantly lower uh, trip before appeared to be again uh, nearest to the um, articulating uh, surfaces of the joint. And so, as expected, uh, when comparing uh, matrix deposition and, and trip before expression side by side in mechanically loaded joints, and in this case the, uh, the controls being on the left and the, and the treat on the right, there appeared to be a correlation between high levels of trip before expression um, and glycosamine and glycan synthesis. And um, it's fairly unclear why trip before expression was, was relatively uh, normal in some uh, aspects of the joint, but we think potentially that the penetration uh, of the trip before blocker may have just not been uh, deep enough to completely inhibit the expression of trip before through the entire uh, distal uh, femur. And uh, again, this was seen in the, uh, in the medial condyle, so you can see here uh, where there's reduced expression in the um, uh, articulating surface which is again seen as a, a in with a lack of uh, glycosamine or glycans deposition. Um, so to conclude, uh, the findings suggest that the activation of trip 4 by uh, mechanical loading is critical in guiding cartilage growth and extracellular matrix maturation in cartilage, but it may not be um, as critical for mineralization uh, during this stage of development at least. And if the expression of trip 4 is indeed self-regulating, this would suggest that agonists may be potentially quite potent in activating and propagating downstream effects, which may be useful uh, for tissue engineering purposes. And finally, uh, yeah, further investigating the role of trip 4 and other ion channels may improve our understanding of uh, channelopathies, scooter development, as well as um, help overcome some of these uh, tissue engineering challenges that we're stuck with. Uh, finally, I'd like to say uh, a massive thank you to uh, the research team here at the Developmental Biomechanics Group. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it from me. So, so uh, thanks for listening.
Fantastic. So on behalf of everyone, I'm going to clap <laughs> as loudly as I can. I'm sure Chris, Chris. On, uh, on their own, uh, on their own uh, front rooms and bedrooms, wherever they are. Um, so fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Uh, there is the floor is open for questions. So um, to start off with, um, Naomi uh, posted a question asking, how does the frequency uh, tested relate to the movement of the fetus in vivo in your in your mechanical um, stretchy model uh, system? How how did you make that frequency selection? How does that uh, relate to the to the to the real biological system? Sure. Uh, so, so in over, it's actually um, fairly unclear what the uh, the frequency of movements are like over the entire of gestation. But um, there are papers out there that have measured using various techniques such as sign MRI, which is kind of like video MRI, uh, the frequency of uh, fetal kicking, for example, um, and and that that tends to be a, a, a fairly low frequency actually. So um, the frequencies that we uh, looked at in our uh, dynamic loading chambers are, are kind of similar to those uh, found in, in some of those papers. Um, and uh, we would have actually liked to look at um, higher frequencies as well. Uh, unfortunately, we were kind of limited by the, um, the bioreactor um, itself. Um, so we, we wanted to increase and look at sort of one, one hertz uh, plus, which, are, which is often looked at in uh, a lot of in vitro studies, particularly tissue engineering studies looking to uh, uh, grow cartilage and bone. Um, but yeah, so so the frequencies were sort of dependent on uh, some of those uh, earlier papers um, and very much just an exploratory uh, analysis really to begin with. So it, it, j just to follow up on that, are the are the motions primarily derived from the embryo itself? So the embryo itself is kind of partially developed muscles are pushing against the, the bones as they form, or is there some other external mechanism by which those frequencies derived? I, 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 uh, so, I, so you mean in, in, in OVO, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, so so the muscles uh, the muscles actually generate uh, fetal kicks. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So the contraction of the muscles in OVO actually generate those kicks, and and turns out those kicks are really really important for for joint development. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So hang on, I'll go and have another look at the chat. So David Hoy um, asks, great talk with beautiful images. Did you analyze the expression of trip V4 specifically within the mineralizing region and then compare it to cartilage? Uh, no, so that's a, a great question, David. Um, so that is uh, one thing we want to have a look at next is um, we want to look at the uh, expression of trip V4 in, in mineral. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of it's, it's kind of a, a, a difficult to, to get all the right sections, particularly with, with bone, um, because uh, you need to obtain probably significantly uh, thicker sections uh, to look at the variation of trip before expression in bone. Um, I haven't shown any images on my slides today, um, but um, uh, bone, so with the sections that I was looking at 10 uh, micrometers, um, you can't really see uh, a good uh, sort of section of bone to, to look at the variation of expression, but uh, that is something that we'll be uh, hopefully looking at next with thicker tissue sections. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to check that nobody's got their hands up. Uh, I think we're OK. And there was one last question. Oh, no, sorry, as a comment from someone else. Uh, we ha are exactly on time. So uh, it only remains to me uh, to thank Ndal for a wonderful talk. Um, round of applause and thank you. move on. Um, so where's Ali? Gone. Would you like to unmute yourself and I mean, step yes. forward? Sure. Let me just share. There we go. There we go. Well. Thanks very much. Um, so, same drill again. Uh, we have another talk from uh, Ali Shafti in Aldo Faisal's lab. Um, we're going to uh, hold the questions for the end, if you wouldn't mind. So, um, pop stuff uh, in the in the chat if you have any questions, or raise your hand. Um, Ali joins us, uh, did his PhD at King's in robotics and is now studying uh, very similar things. So um, human in the loop robotic motor control at, uh, at uh, King's and is now studying um, understandable or human understandable uh, motor systems in uh, Aldo's lab. Um, so if you'd uh, like to take it away with explainer robotics through human motor control, I will shut up and see you in a half an hour. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me. 
and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, yeah, so as Chris mentioned, I'm Ali. I'm a postdoc in Aldo's lab in the Brain and Behavior Lab, and explainable robotics is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to explain to you um, what it means and why it's important and how we try to implement it. Um, so just a little bit about our lab. We are the Brain and Behavior Lab at the Department of Bioengineering and the Department of Computing. We're generally interested in, in the action perception loop that drives human behavior but also artificial behavior. So uh, just for uh, anyone who might not be familiar with the term, the action perception loop describes how we interact with the world around us and how we perceive it. So the way it works is the world is around you. You perceive the world, that's the perception part. You analyze this, you make some decisions, and those decisions lead to actions. So once you act on the world, the world is now changed. You've manipulated it. So now you need to perceive it again. So therefore the loop keeps on going between perception and action. And we study this in the context of neuroscience, machine learning, and robotics. So I run the robotics activities of the lab, but I also work closely with our neuroscience and machine learning researchers in the lab as well. I'm personally very interested in physical human-robot interaction, and this is a relatively new topic of research because previously we were only dealing with these type of robots, which are really large, really heavy, and really dangerous, so therefore humans have to be kept away from them. They need to be caged robots. Um, however, nowadays, we're dealing with robots that are specifically made for close physical human-robot interaction, and they're used in different contexts, as you can see here. So there's surgical ones, there's collaborative industrial ones, autonomous cars, rehabilitation robotics, and exoskeletons. All of these come in very close physical contact with you when you use them. Now, this is exciting because it means we can now study a whole new area. So we can see how physical interaction happens up close, what happens in collaborations, how does human-human collaboration translate to human-robot collaboration, and so on. So, however, with all of that, there comes the issue of explainability. Now, to, to explain explainability to you and why it's important. So explainability is raised in artificial intelligence research these days very heavily. That's particularly because many artificial intelligence algorithms, such as neural networks, they are hard to decipher. So it's this sort of black box. You cannot understand all the inner workings of them. But when it comes to robotics and trustworthy robotics, the issue is a bit different. It's just a different manifestation of it because we're dealing with physical motion and being able to understand and interpret physical motion. So just as a si very simple example, um, Imagine a drill. Now, a drill is typically explained to you. You understand, you know what to expect. You press the button, the drill bit starts rotating. You stop pressing the button, it will stop rotating. You don't need to understand all the inner workings of it, but you do understand the physical activity that you're dealing with. Now, imagine one time you stop pressing the button and the drill keeps on drilling. Now, that would uh, alarm you, right? You would wonder what's going on because you cannot explain this new behavior. And this lack of explainability will cause you not to trust the device anymore. You wonder it might cause damage, it might cause injury. So you leave it aside until you look into it and can explain what's going on and can fix it. Now, the same thing happens in physical interaction and physical collaboration. So imagine here two workers are moving a heavy item. Uh, and this is quite straightforward. Both of them know what to expect and what to go with. But if suddenly worker number two sits down, or worker number one lifts the item way up over their head, all of these would be unexplained to the other person and would alarm them. They would wonder what's going on. They will ask you, why are you doing that? And if they cannot understand why you're doing that, they're going to stop working with you because they can't trust you. It's unsafe to lift an object like that, for example. So this was just examples to understand why in physical human-robot interaction, we cannot just have intelligence without explaining it. Now, we don't have to fully understand all the inner workings of the, uh, of the intelligent algorithms that are running things, but we need to be able to understand the physical manifestation in the world, right? And without that, the interaction would be unsafe, people would not trust it, it would not be intuitive, and that makes it useless. Because people will not adopt it, but even if people were going to adopt it, health and safety requirements would not allow it to go forward. Now, I like to think about the problem of explainability in physical human-robot interaction as such, and I'm going to try to get my 
laser pointer here. So I like to think about it as human motor control is facing robot control. Now, we, one possible way to think about human motor control is a hierarchical architecture. Where on the top, you have cognitive, uh, cognitive interaction with the world and cognitive understanding of the task. Further down, you have motor coordination, and further down, you reach motion. Now, similarly, on the robot side, uh, I see the best approach to have the AI task level on the cognitive level. So be able to communicate with a human on a cognitive level without having to go into the lower level complexities of the robot system or the task. But then further down, for example, on the robot motion planner side, if you are physically linking a human to the robot, you are going to have a biomechanical interaction and you want to be able to consider human motor coordination in your robot motion planner. And once you do all of this, the robot motion then will also be interpretable and understandable to the human and this physical interaction will feed back to the cognitive level allowing you to understand the task and the behavior of the robot better now the activities we do in the lab and the research that i do deals with different parts of this diagram some of them are dealing with all of it some of them are one box or one level i'm going to give two examples of this for today uh, one of them is an assistive robot setup where the focus is on that cognitive level and how we can interface humans on a cognitive level to tell our robots what to do. The other one is on collaborative robots and that deals more with the entire diagram. How can we, is it possible to learn to collaborate together with a human and a robot so that we learn together so that the explainability is sort of built in because we, we build the skills together. Now let's go forward with that. So on the assisted robot side, we're dealing with this problem where we have uh, people with, uh, with certain disabilities that are not allowing them to reach and grasp. So it could be paralysis or spinal cord injuries. And we're trying to assist them with a robotic system. But we don't want them to deal with all the low level, high uh, dimensionality uh, co control uh, aspects of the robotic system. So we want to find a good interface between the brain and the robotic system. Now, typically this is done uh, quite heavily researched in brain computer interfaces and our colleagues there uh, have done a lot of very interesting work where they do uh, neural interfacing through implants that are surgically placed and then they use brain signals and training over time to be able to control degrees of freedom of robotic systems that assist you with reaching and grasping and these have had very impressive results particularly in the last decade however they are invasive they require surgery they do require long training time, sometimes in, a ma in the order of months. So we are trying to look for an interface that is uh, easier to learn, more explainable, more intuitive, and non-invasive. So we looked into eye movements, and eye movements have long been thought, thought to, be as a, uh, to be able to serve as a window to cognition. So there's a paper in 1967 by Yarbrough, quite famous in the field, where people are asked to look at a picture and then are given different cues, such as examine it freely, guess the age of the people, or how long has the man been away? And then their gaze patterns are recorded. And you can see very clearly from these images that the patterns are very different depending on the task the person is dealing with. So here, we're trying to see if we can reverse that. Can we look at your gaze patterns and the context of the environment and what you're looking at and all of that, and reverse this? Can we then tell from that what it is you want to do and then help you with that so we create this hardware setup uh, we have uh, eye tracking glasses up here 3d depth camera up here to give us the context of the environment we have a robotic arm universal robots ur10 to lift the user's arm and move it around we have a robotic glove by biocerebro here that is there to actuate the fingers of the user now first we want to understand where are you looking so the eye trackers will give us your 2D gaze point, and we combine that with information, depth information we get from the 3D camera, and some fun calculations, as you can see here, which paper in ECRO 2019, and combining all of this together, we're able to obtain uh, uh, the 3D point of gaze in absolute coordinates that the robotic system can. Then we want to know what it is you're looking at, and for that, we use information. So we use a typical convolutional neural, net, neural network uh, trained on objects of daily living, daily activities, 
And that allows us to run this in real time, very close to real time, and detect objects that are in your surrounding. So now we know where the gaze is falling, we know the objects, so we know what you're looking at. Question is, what is it you want to do? So for that, to narrow down the problem, we think of it, we think of our actions the same way we think of language. So in language, we have sentences that are made of words and they have a certain sequence, a certain rule that governs them and that those rules are grammars. Once you follow the grammars, you can combine words together and make meaningful sentences. Now similarly, our behavior and our action can be thought of in the same way. So getting ready in the morning involves brushing your teeth, taking a shower and brushing your teeth involves smaller actions itself. Now the rules here define this sequence and they mean that you cannot brush before opening your mouth, for example. But there are other changes you can make. So for example, you can take brush teeth, you can take it into the shower, right? You could shower your teeth in the shower, uh, brush your teeth in the shower if you want to. So we can extract rules from human behavior and this we can actually do in, in a data-driven manner. So we uh, we can uh, collect uh, data of human behavior, we can annotate it, run it in grammar induction algorithms and extract these grammars of the behavior. Then we give the grammars to our AI system and it's able to basically make new sentences for you the same way uh, Google does autocomplete for you and can guess what you're about to write and guess what it is you're about to do. So you look at a cup, you're now narrowing down the options. So that it's not a, a, an infinite number of actions you're able to do next, there's a few actions you're able to do next. And that narrowing down reduces the dimensionality of the problem and we can then select between them based on your gaze patterns and the context of the environment, resulting in a meaningful sequence of action. And you can combine them in different ways and uh, obtain these sequences of action. So let's see that happening in the video. So here my colleague looked at the cop, you can see their view up here. We detected their intention of action. The sequence was selected as picking up the cop. Now they look at the bowl. The sequence is to go to the bowl and pour it into the bowl. You wouldn't place a cup in the bowl. That's not that's not allowed by the grammar, grammar, right? Because it doesn't make sense. However, he's still holding the cup. Now he looks at the table with an intention to interact with it, uh, and the sequence becomes placing it on the table because you wouldn't pour it on the table. Now, combining that with uh, motion planning that considers human kinematics and controls the trajectory of the arm all of, at all the points along the way, we're able to make robot motions that are also better interpretable for the human user. And putting all of that together, we're finally able to help people with paralysis, such as this gentleman here, to reach, grasp, and interact with objects again. So he's paralyzed in the hand and arm, and this was 10 minutes of calibration, maybe five, 10 minutes of just playing around, getting used to the system and to the motions, and he's able to just look at an orange, the system identifies his intention, goes there, picks it up for him. He then looks at the ball and the system proceeds to fulfill the task for him. So we're now able to assist users and he doesn't have to learn anything. He just looks as items as, uh, as he usually would. Now, so that sort of covered this top level, the cognitive interaction where the human was able to uh, uh, inform the AI task planner of their intentions through cognitive interaction, but also we have biomechanical interaction because we have a human physically attached to a robot. So the robot motion planner had to take into account human motor coordination uh, requirements. Now, moving forward to the other case, which is the collaborative robots case. So here we're talking about collaboration. This is a much more complex problem perhaps, um, just due to the collaboration and the real time interaction of it. So can we learn this at the same time together? So some work in the field uh, has focused on this, on the more AI side of things. Uh, there's a lot of focus on shared autonomy, which basically means you have an AI algorithm that fine tunes your action. So you apply an action to fulfill a task and the AI just adjusts it for you. Um, there's a lot of work on that. There's a lot of work also on the motor neuroscience side on one player, two player, human, human interactions or human machine interactions, where they look at the problem through a game theory approach, which is very interesting as well. Um, here, we're interested in creating a setup that is not sort of a reductionist lab setup like these ones, and it's not fine tuning of actions or turn-based collaboration, but rather as in turn-based coordination, 
uh, but rather it's collaboration in real time with the same amount of action input. For that, we designed this task. Now, the task is quite simple. You've got a ball, you want to reach the goal. Uh, it's a sort of ball and maze game. You've got some obstacles and you need to get through this gate here. Um, you can do that by rotating this tray along this axis and this other orthogonal axis. Now, both movements are done by a robot that is holding the tray, but one of those axes, the control of it, is assigned to a reinforcement learning agent, and the other axis is assigned to a human that is controlling it optically, basically teleoperating it. Now, what does that mean? If you want this ball to go diagonally to go through this opening, you need both of these axes to be rotated. So you need collaboration at the same time. If the human only does it, you end up going up here in the corner. You cannot go through. So they need to learn to work together to reach there. So we're enforcing real-time collaboration. Now, just to highlight what um, reinforcement learning is for any of you who might not be familiar, so it's sort of a mathematical model uh, of the action perception loop I was describing in the beginning of my talk. So there's an environment, the, the, the environment uh, emits uh, states, and the state is a representation of what is going on in the environment. The agent will receive those states, and based on the state that it receives, it will emit an action. The action is done on the environment, resulting in a new state and a reward for that action that was just performed. So the agent over time, looking at that reward, try, gets conditioned to do certain actions because it's trying to maximize the reward. It's basically the same way you would train a dog by giving them treats to do certain actions. Now, here, our reinforcement learning agent receives as states the position and velocity of the ball on the board and the angular position and velocity of the tray along these two axes. The action of the agent and the human are sampled and implemented for 200 millisecond control frames that follow each other. So we take the action of both of them and we implement it at the same time. A single trial is made of uh, 40, sorry, if may, is made of 200 of these control frames, which is 40 seconds, unless the ball reaches the goal, at which point the trial ends. Um, and yeah, just in the details, the reward that the agent receives is plus 10 if it reaches the goal. If not for any control frame that it doesn't reach it, it loses one point, it's basically being punished. And we're implementing this using a soft actor critic uh, architecture. So let's see some videos here. So this is early on in the training, and you can see the collaboration is not good. They're not able to go beyond the barrier. And this is similar to how you would collaborate with a colleague in a new job, in a new task. Both of you are new to the task, but you're also new to each other. So it takes time to get used to it, right? But this is after 30 minutes. Now, both the human and the agent have developed better skills and they've developed a joint policy. And you can see they're able to much faster get to the second half. And there, after some back and forth, they can reach the goal. Now, we did this also in a human-human setup, just to see if the task is difficult for humans or not. And we see it's really not trivial. When you separate those two axes of rotation, the task becomes rather difficult. And you can see even humans are struggling to reach the goal together. They do reach it, but it's just similarly strong. Now, just to give you a better intuition of how this whole system is running, this is me having some fun with the system, learning things over time. So this is after 130 trials of training. You can see we have two problems. One is around the goal, the agent has very large course movements. That makes it very hard for me to reach the goal. The other problem is this corner here, the agent doesn't have a good policy to get out of it. So I'm stuck and I need to sort of flip around to get the ball out of it. So we train the agent, well, we train together for 10 trials and that's about eight minutes. Test it again. Now we see the course movements have gone. We have very fine control near the goal, but the corner issue is still there, is just as bad as it was. So another eight minutes and now both issues are gone. So you can see Near the goal, it's very fine controls that helps me reach the goal rather quickly. And aside from the goal, in the corners, the, uh, the agent pushes me out very quickly. It doesn't let me get there. Now, closely here, I just push the ball into the corner and you can see the agent immediately kicks it out. 
Um, I'm going to then leave my tray and go, and you can see the agent on its own. So it's sort of passing the ball to the center, waiting for me to help it get through the uh, through the opening, but I'm not there to help it. So it sort of keeps balancing it there in the middle. Now, we wanted to test this a bit more systematically. So first we ran some, um, some uh, preliminary experiments with 10 subjects. We identified the subjects that were performing the best in the human agent teams. And please, for more uh, quantified analysis of all of this, please see our paper in IRIS 2020. Here, I'm just giving a very high level description of it. Um, we then have new participants training for 80 trials. That's about 55 minutes. And then they test with their own agent, as well as agents of other people that perform well for them. And we don't tell them they're playing with their own agent. We just tell them you're playing with a few agents that you're testing. See what happens there. And I'm going to change my pointer so I can control the video. So here, our participant is playing with agent S1. This worked well for subject one, but it's not working so well for her. You can see here, uh, it's it, for for that person it was optimal. They had collaborated together to re get there, but for her it's not so good. Similarly for S5, they cannot collaborate so well. Now. Point here is this is comes back again to explainability because she she hasn't developed this agent herself. She cannot explain the behavior of it, so she doesn't know what's expected of her. So they cannot collaborate well together. Right? But if you move to when she plays with her own agent, you will see a very drastic uh, difference. So here this is her own agent, and you can see how efficiently they can move to the second half and reach the goal with very fine movements. Now, again, this is because both the agent and the human understand each other much better because they grew up together on this task. Basically, they developed the skills together. Now, interestingly, this is a personalized policy that effect that we see here, and our data shows that as well. We're not only seeing personalized policies, but we also see that your policy can be used to predict how good you would play with other agents without you having actually played with them, because that's the level to which you personalize your own agent. Now, this sort of covers the entirety of this diagram. Um, and just to conclude overall what we're talking about. So I tried to highlight the importance of explainability and how it's essential if we want to have trustworthy physical human robot interaction. Uh, we demonstrated the human loop approaches in AI and how they can be leveraged for explainability. Uh, we've also developed other methods, so hierarchical reinforcement learning for explainability in robotics. That's the video you see up here, and there's a paper, IRIS 2019, where we described that. I just didn't have the time to go over that today as well. We implement this in different areas, right? So we've used it for autonomous cars, as you can see in the second video here. We also use it for supernumerary robotics and other studies. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Aldo and our team who've been very supportive with all of these projects. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. So, as I say, I will clap on behalf of everyone for an excellent talk. Um, floor is open for questions. So, if anybody does have any questions, start tapping away in the chat, or I'll just double check that nobody's got their hand raised. Hang on. Nope, no hand raised. Oh, there we go. So, we've got a, a question already um, from Naomi Nakayama. Uh, another great talk. How consistent is the task dependent gaze pattern amongst different individuals? Right, so that's a very interesting question. So um, I would say it depends on the task. So one of the videos that I showed here, uh, this second one, we do the same idea in the context of driving. And we try to sort of uh, understand where would people look in a driving task and use that to make better autonomous cars. Um, there is some personalization and there is some effects of having learned to do a task. You tend to check certain details less often, but you can average out to certain gaze patterns that repeat for everyone. So if it is about understanding areas of an object or areas of a scene that you would pay attention to if you're trying to do a task, those tend to be in average similar. The, the, the finer details would change between uh, participants, and it mostly has to do with the skill that they have. Fantastic. Um, so moving on from that question, I mean, similar kind of idea. What, um, what, what does the subject do if, for instance, they don't want to put the orange in the bowl or 
whatever the computer predicts because presumably you need some form of feedback to say i'm unhappy with how this event is is occurring sure so the way this uh the setup that i showed here uh implements the tasks in a deterministic manner so that means once a sequence is identified it goes to fulfill it of course the sequences are partial sequences so it's uh, once you pick it up, you have a chance to change your mind and put it back down on the table, right? But a, uh, a more complete way to do it would be to implement this in a probabilistic manner. So as the as the uh, action is being fulfilled, you keep observing your gaze and your behavior and to try to understand from that if you change your mind and we can actually bring you back and do something else. Uh, otherwise, a more trivial approach would be just to have a feedback mechanism where they can just announce they're unhappy with an action and cancel it right there. Right. Okay. Fantastic. Um, we have another question from Nathaniel Rose um, who says, great talk. How does the action grammar topography become mapped to the user gaze? Is this constructed or learned with correlation? So the way, uh, as I explained, so the way we implemented in here, uh, the gaze pattern is not part of the action grammar. You can do it that way as well. The way I described it here, the action grammar defines the different sequences, the different pathways you can follow to fulfill tasks. The gaze pattern is, show, is used to indicate which of these paths you want to go down, down on. So it, we basically use the action grammars to limit the options so that we can solve the problem by indicating it through gaze. Cool. OK, sorry, I, I, I didn't quite understand the uh, the link between the two. Um, so uh, Yilin Sun says, inspiring talk. I still don't understand the part of cognitive control. What kind of data of people's thought has been transformed to that to that the machine could learn and interpret? Sorry if you included that part and I missed it. Sorry, I didn't catch the. the, the yeah, the... so I, I, I'll, I'll try and rephrase it. Um, the, what I think the question is, uh, what aspects of people's thoughts have, have been, or how how has the user's intention been inferred? Is it just a um, a, a correlative, uh, like the the person has gazed in this direction before, and therefore they want to do the same thing again, or is there some deeper understanding of the of the mental model that people use? So so, I'll exp so if we're talking about that gaze setup particularly, so not the general idea that I'm describing here, uh, uh, the idea of gaze is, and the idea of cognitive interaction is, if I want to grasp this bottle, I will not think in joint space, thinking my shoulder has to move, my elbow has to move, my wrist has to move, and then my fingers have to move. I will just think I want to grasp this bottle. Now, to communicate that to the robotic system, we have to make this hierarchy of uh, robot control. But for the cognitive cognitive interaction, having the context of the environment that tells me this is a bottle, the person's gaze has fallen on the bottle, and then being able to understand from the pattern of the gaze that you actually want to interact with it. You're not just inspecting the object. That's all we take. The rest is action grammars. So. Once I can understand from the pattern of your gaze, and that's a data-driven approach that we can implement. Once I understand from the pattern of your gaze that you actually physically want to interact, you're not just looking around. The rest is action grammars telling me what sequence of actions are possible for me now and what I can continue to do. I cool. hope that uh, I hope so. Um, Yilin Sun, if if that wasn't the the question or if I misinterpreted it, um, please let us know and, and we can invite you up to rephrase the question or, or something. Um, I will ask one last question before because we are just over time. Um, but I was interested philosophically with the um, the idea of an explainable robot. You you gave a very nice analogy analogy with the drill that you know one time when it keeps going and it, you think something's wrong. How will we know when a when a black box algorithm goes wrong? Like how how can we trust that, for example, uh, a, a, a self driving car in the previous hundred miles hasn't driven off the road? But how do I know it's not going to drive off the road in the next mile? <laughs> or so do I not? That is a challenge, right? But no. So I think uh, the the whole idea is that you need to have uh, an architecture. That's the reason why I highlight the hierarchical architecture. You need to have an art architecture where there are so many levels of fail safe and so many levels of un explaining what is going on so that you don't even reach that point, right? So that even if the black box algorithm is failing to do something, we're able to communicate this properly to the human, but also to stop whatever is going wrong. 
So the challenge there is with these black box uh, algorithms, there's a lot of active research these days on explainable AI and trying to understand the inner workings. Um, I, I don't see it as an immediate thing that we're going to be able to fully understand them. So I think the, the idea should be that we should sort of zoom out, abstract away, and on the higher level, try to explain what's going on to the human. Um, so I believe that remains a challenge, but I think we should have safety layers that block that sort of situation to form care. Okay, fantastic. Um, we have one last question that just chopped, uh, came up in the chat, which uh, I think I'll, I will try and um, phrase phrase uh, in, in a way I, I understand. Um, so the question from uh, Sloke Meta, I do apologize, I probably butchered that. Um, with the co uh, the cobot inter or the, the, the uh, interaction between robot and human, uh, do the, both the human and the robot have the same information available? And are they aware of the task and also have the same motion planning algorithms? Or is the collaborator's intention also inferred? So obviously they do not have, they do not have the same information, right? So when they, when the reinforcement learning agent starts, it's blank. It knows nothing of the dynamics of the game. It's starting from scratch. It just receives states and rewards and it needs to make decisions. Whereas the human, uh, a human just looking at that task, they understand what they need to do. So there is a, there is a mi mi mismatch over there, but actually this helps because we notice that our agent is able to learn rather quickly. The reason for that is if a reinforcement learning agent is left on its own to solve this, it would basically be randomly exploring for a while until good things happen. So it takes a long time for it to find the goal and assign value to be near the goal. Whereas if a human is there, they can sort of guide this noisy behavior of the agent and getting, get it closer to the goal, right? So this knowledge of the human actually helps the agent and it means the agent ends up reaching the goal more often early on in the game, which means it starts making a better representation of the area around the goal, that it's of high value, that it's good to be there. Um, so that's what it is. It is not inferring anything from the human. It doesn't, it's not aware of the human. The human's action is encoded in the state that it receives, right? The human's action changes the angle of the trade and it sees the angle of the trade has changed. So from the agent's point of view, it's just dealing with a noisy trade. It doesn't know it's a human. 